All right. Hello. Hi, Ho Silver, and also known as Bunker Bullion. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? It's good to talk to you again. It's very good. It's very good. So I uh, would love to keep this going. And thanks for coming back and joining our show. I always um, enjoy. Yeah. So I've always uh, seen you as a veteran and maybe a veteran who was so early in the game that you had to find your own path. So I'm just wondering when you first started stacking silver, what were some of your, uh, what did you focus on? Well, I remember specifically, my uh, brother has some land up in uh, Northern Washington state and we were sitting in uh, a little outbuilding and talking about how I was thinking I should start getting some gold because I didn't have anything besides, uh, you know, stocks and retirement account type things. I didn't have any physical assets. So I was talking to him about that. And we talked about different strategies. The first thing that I um, really accepted was that I didn't know anything about it. And I had no idea what I was doing. And so just, just that realization and acceptance led me to kind of craft my beginning strategies with a, a low downside risk thinking. So I started pretending I was stacking silver and used that as a way to um, kind of play around and see what would happen if I implemented certain strategies or tried to do certain things. Would this be a winner? Would this be a loser? Um, and that was my... Um, kind of my path to educating myself on something that I really didn't have a clue about. That's great. So you, you so you road tested some things on paper and mm -hmm. saw where it would lead. So once you got a little taste of some paper success and set, paper setbacks, what, what was one of the first things that you started to purchase? Um, I started... One of my weaknesses with silver stacking, and this would be something to keep in mind, is if you have a collector bug, it can work against you. And I started with generic type things, um, but I also wanted one of each. <laughs> so when I, saw, when I saw a design that I liked or whatever, I kind of wanted to collect. So, um, that kind of just goes back to when I was a kid, I would collect rocks or collect various things, you know, just because that there was always a hunt. There was always a pursuit and that, that keeps you excited when you're always hunting for something, especially men. We like to, we like to go out and hunt things that we want. Um, so I kind of started collecting at first within the kind of generic realm all the different designs you can get within that same premium structure of just low premium generic stuff. And I'd, I'd have to say that was a mistake as far as the financial part, um, because I wasn't focused on what was the purpose of this particular kind of silver. And mm -hmm. the purpose of course, is to get as much weight as you can with as low a premium as you can. And I was finding myself more motivated by, oh, that's cool. Yeah. And uh, so after, you know, a couple hundred ounces of doing it that way, I really started to consider, okay, I need to, I need to really narrow this down and decide what's the purpose of this particular class of silver bullion. And that's when I started changing to setting money aside to buy in bulk. Um, and things like that to where I could add more weight with less cost. Yeah, so just focusing on the, um, the variety, did you find that the variety hurt you in having uh, too many things if you ever wanted to sell it and it wasn't easy for the other people to count or was it even hard for you to count what you had? Um, no, it was more um, paying more than made sense. Uh, so as another thing that I did as I was learning and getting started was to really um, think about what's going to happen with this silver when I'm exiting. So an exit strategy you'll hear a lot in the silver stacking world. What am I going to do with this? And so I, 
I quickly realized no matter how cool the design within the quote generic class, you're going to get what you get. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't matter how neat it is typically, at least based on my exit strategy. Yeah. And uh, which was um, what all stackers should do is what, what purchasers do you have easy access to? Mm -hmm. And you talk with them and you hang out at the coin stores and you kind of question and you, you find out, well, how much premium do you purchase this for? What do you sell this for? And then what's the spread? And so I just kind of discovered that just because I liked it doesn't mean that it has any more value when I sell it. And yeah. so that's when I started to really focus on that. That's when I changed my belief that it's good to stack what you like. That's another phrase you'll hear in the stacking world a lot. Oh, stack what you like. And I quickly figured out, no, I'm going to stack what other people like. Right, and, right. Uh, and that was a way to keep me focused on what is the spread? What's the gap between the premium I pay and the premium I can expect when I sell? Yeah. So what were some of the things that you found that... Um stack what other people like what sort of products or size or where were the bat where was the most value for you uh it it sent me towards silver eagles for one um and it it really starts to narrow the choices so it narrowed my choices to just straight generic it doesn't matter at all the condition it doesn't matter the style or the mint or any of that and just call that straight up bullion and its value is determined solely by its silver and uh and so then your purchaser will pay you a certain premium on that regardless no matter what it is and a lot of times wholesalers wholesalers will just take those things and and melt them Mm -hmm. And then they get their $1 spread and, and rinse and repeat. Um, but it also sent me towards Silver Eagles because I found that by deal searching, I could get Silver Eagles for about the same price as I could get a typical generic round. And that became another strategy that I used. I call it stepping up or a, a ladder concept where I could get for the same investment, I could step up to a, a higher resale value. So instead of buying 20 generic rounds, I could buy 20 Silver Eagles by searching out a deal or by using incentives or credit card kickbacks, all of that. And then that gave me more value on the selling end because people pay more for certain products. And Silver Eagles was the first step up on that. You could say maybe Perth Mint, things like koalas or kookaburras might be the next step up. Mm -hmm. So then I would just kind of deploy the same concept. Okay, well, I can get a Silver Eagle for this, but I could get a kookaburra for this and it might have a 50 cent more premium on resale. It all mm -hmm. kind of came down to understanding the exit, understanding the market as a seller instead of a buyer. Mm -hmm. And that made a, made a really big difference for me. Yeah, that's great. So it made a big difference on silver. H using some of that uh, thought process, how did that apply to uh, getting involved with gold? Well, initially, I was first thinking about getting into gold. And as a lot of new uh, metals bugs discover, um, it costs a lot more than silver. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so a lot of us decide, okay, well, we'll just get started with silver. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. um, initially, when I started acquiring gold, I was in the 10th ounce cost category where I was comfortable at that 10th ounce price. Mm -hmm. um, and the premiums on the fractional gold um, do sustain. So if I purchased a American gold Eagle, a 10th ounce, or even a quarter ounce, a quarter ounce is a really good size. If that, mm. if that's within the budget. Um, but I soon, because of what I wanted the gold for, I went to one ounce pieces. 
Um, and I got most of those purchasing from major dealers on eBay. Now this may have changed some over the last decade or so, but at the time there were a lot of incentives on eBay that you could capitalize by using. Um, they had e-bucks. I don't know if that's still a thing, but uh, I was, I was um, stacking pretty seriously. So I would get offers from eBay 10% uh ebooks as a kickback uh -huh. stuff uh -huh. like that and it was like okay but they had rules where that wouldn't apply to bullion mm. but certain dealers like uh, modern coin mart and appmex would always have something that i could get the ebooks on and so i would just search around and find somebody that listed it wrong or whatever so i was getting one ounce gold things at well under spot and that's kind of how I built the gold stack. But it was all the same. If you're going to stack silver or gold, if you're really into it, that's going to lead you in different directions. If you just want to have it as an asset, then you'll make different choices. Maybe you just want it on paper. Maybe you just want silver or gold mining um, so that you can dollar cost average in with your regular stock portfolio. But if you really uh, want to go for it and have fun doing it, it's going to open up because it's a whole wonderful world uh, of cool stuff. And for me, I wanted to do it. I was fascinated by it and I, I became somewhat obsessed by it. And uh, so that led me into some of those little rabbit holes that maybe uh, wouldn't be a smart move for some people that don't want to invest the time into really educating themselves. That's where I see people get in trouble uh -huh. uh, is when their, uh, their knowledge base is inadequate for the task they're trying to, uh, trying to do and they find themselves in trouble or uh, upside down, so to speak. Yeah, so you bought from local coin stores and you're really good at seeking out online deals with eBay. Yeah. I actually didn't buy much from local coin stores at first. Okay because uh -huh. I could do better by kind of using credit card kickbacks and uh -huh. eBay kickbacks and things like that. Um, okay. Later, I used the coin stores mostly to be my teachers and yeah. just to hang out and ask questions. And, and most coin store owners are, are pretty lonely. <laughs> so they love when you roll in and just hang out. You know, bring yeah. them a coffee and just sit down and talk about, hey, I see these here sometimes. What's the deal with those? Or yeah. what do you do when you get more silver than you can sell? And they talk about wholesaling, you know. Um, but then as you get to know your local coin store owners, they would call me. They knew what I liked. I liked I liked old vintage rounds. Mm -hmm. And so whenever somebody would come in with a, a box full of old rounds, I'd get a phone call. Hi ho, I got some stuff you might like. And then, so I would go down and I'm, again, this is using that step up strategy or the climbing the ladder concept. Uh -huh. So I would get what I knew to be more valuable than generic at the generic price. Yeah. So if I could get something that's more unusual made by Inglehart or Johnson Mathe or any other that I knew, oh, that's a toned piece by Inglehart. I'm going to get more than the typical spread. So that's when I started getting into uh, the local coin stores. I'm not in a very large market. There's probably about 80,000 people in our area. So we only had a couple of choices. Mm -hmm. But as I got to know them, they helped me find those opportunities that could make me a little extra on the sell. And right. So it's like the local barber shop. I guess, yeah. It's like, what's what's the word on the street? You know. Yeah. yeah. So a, a part of the part of the routine. Um, so let's see. What were some of your um, What were some of the goals that you set, or some of the techniques you, you set to hunting and saving? So uh, some people know the term sandbox mode. Uh, when learning new software on a computer, I kind of did that at first. And that was a way for me to explore without actually putting any money on the table. 
And uh, so that was one thing I did was just load my cart up with things, but never make the purchase. Uh, take yeah. notes, see what happens when I would always follow financial news. I, I'm a, a poor sleeper, so I would be up at 4 a.m. on most mornings and just kind of listen to different financial folks. And, and I would pay attention to what happened with spot price when certain news happened. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even need to understand the why of things. It's like, oh, when this happens, spot goes down. Hmm. typically or when this happens i can think maybe spot will go up you know things like that so i started to associate um where silver would be based on other conditions and that led me to uh finding a a chart analyst or a technical analysis person on youtube named grok trade g-r-o-k and uh i was purchasing daily at that point with a dollar cost average concept. Um, but by following him and what I liked about his channel, he's a, he's a teacher of technical analysis, but he has no, he has no interest in what happens with silver or gold. And so a lot of the technical analysis that you see on YouTube and others, they have an interest, whether it's overt or not, it's, they care whether silver goes up or silver goes down because they have an interest in that. This guy was completely didn't care at all. He just was looking at charts. And mm -hmm. so I found by following him and there are others, he's the only one that I have enough confidence in to, to mention to others because uh, I use his advice super, super successfully. So I would dollar cost average into a separate stacking account as opposed to actually purchasing the metals using dollar cost averaging. If you're not familiar with what dollar cost averaging, that is you just set a budget and you put it in to whatever financial asset class you're trying to get into. And you don't care what the stock price is because over time it averages. So that's the concept. And I use that, but I kind of made a hybrid model based on the technical analysis. He would say, he would say, watch this with the dollar, watch this with the banking stocks. And then right there, that would be an opportunity. So I would, instead of dollar cost averaging into the asset itself, I set up a separate bank account, which was my stacking account. And I would dollar cost average into that. And then from there, I would watch his analysis and find those times where I'm going to buy big. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on his advice, I did really, really well. That's great. That's great. What were some of the ways that you kept track of what you were buying? Uh, uh, visual, uh, lists, computers, like how did you keep track of what you were doing and what was working? Um, I didn't do that very well. Okay. And uh, for, for new stackers and, and veterans, you have to do that now much better. So I, uh, I didn't really keep track of stuff. I would keep track of an inventory. I had inventories in certain places. And for me, after a couple of years, uh, focusing on my exit strategy, I really wanted what I call my perma stack. And that's just straight up gold bullion, straight up low premium silver, um, mm -hmm. silver eagles and junk silver. Mm -hmm. And all of that was not for me to keep. That was to leave to my heirs. Mm -hmm. So I would inventory those and I would put, this is what it is. And I would just put it in a category. This is low premium. This is medium premium. This is high premium. Eventually I got rid of everything besides the low premium mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't want to leave my, my wife a part-time job. <laughs> I wanted to leave her an asset. And so we took steps to make sure she knew how to kind of access that. But nowadays you have to keep track of what you paid, especially now with the new rules on selling on eBay or other third party uh, sites, because the limit when I was doing that sort of thing was 20,000 bucks. So I could sell up to 20,000 bucks on eBay without having to specifically account for each piece in my taxes. Right. Um, 
one year, I, I went further than that. After I started my Bunker Bullion brand, I went over the 20,000 on, on the, the eBay. And so then they start sending that to the IRS. And I had done, um, I do everything above board and honestly, but I reported it as extra income. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it would have been capital gains. Mm -hmm. And so I got a letter from the IRS saying I owed them $48,000 and blah, blah. That's when I got uh, a lawyer team and an accountant team and went more legit. We refiled the taxes and ended up, I hit the number just about right, but didn't do it correctly. Now yeah. the threshold's only $600. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. It's a lot different, right. isn't it? If you sell one thing, you have to know what you paid for it. Yeah, And if you made a profit on it, you have to account for that as capital gains or, or have some other trick that somebody who knows such things helps you deal with. But that's right. something that I could see future stackers finding themselves in trouble, especially as financial transactions are more tracked and mm -hmm. pursued than they've ever been. Now we'll get uh, artificial intelligence in the game trying to figure out if you're paying your taxes right so that would be something that it'd be good for people to do is to really keep a record of what you paid for each thing that you have yeah yeah that's great so i love your uh, silver poured uh pieces very talented and very shiny can Thank you, you give us an update on uh the valley forge round how's it the doing? valley forge no, the valley forge prayer at uh it's called In God We Trust, Prayer at Valley Forge. Um, there's a mintage of a thousand, and I'm at about 55% sold. It's a higher premium piece. It's uh, available on AppMex, but it's available for five bucks less on uh, my tastysilver.com site. That's okay. a piece that, uh, that we visited about before, and I'm very yeah. proud of it. Yeah. I'm hoping to uh, get to about 90% sold, and then I'll be commissioning an artist to do the second and third designs and make it into a series, uh, the In God We Trust series. And yeah. the artist would uh, work with me to design the obverse, and we'll keep the same reverse that we used on the uh, Prayer at Valley Ford. Yeah, that's great. I, I'll be sharing some uh, images of the of the round as we're speaking, and have the link that's to it, both yeah. uh, sites where it's available in the description. So, Thank you for that. Yeah, so that's exciting. Um, without getting into not really predictions, but wh what do you think about the price of silver right now? Like, is it uh, exceeding your expectations? Kind of matching your expectations? Well, it's obviously been a good a good year. Uh -huh. If you if you have silver, mm -hmm. if you're buying silver, it's it's been a challenge to know what to do about it, um, because I finished actually adding to my own stack in 2018, and the majority of what I have left is just to be left to my heirs. I don't really care, but uh, it's I purposely, as you know, didn't give a lot of advice on my YouTube channel, but I'm more comfortable doing it now, so I will. Uh -huh. um, there's considerable upside still, and mm -hmm. silver could outperform gold. gold. Gold is the financial tool for war. So sadly, I expect gold to continue to do well because I predict troubles between different groups of humans not killing each other right. uh, so gold is going to be an asset class that um, countries actually purchase which then buoys the value um, and silver will either follow that or lag behind so far um, silver has silver is much more volatile than gold Mm -hmm. That's if you're if you're looking to get into stacking silver. That's something to just know. It's going to trade within a range. Right mm -hmm. now, our range is maybe twenty nine seventy five to thirty one fifty, and we're kind of at. This is where that technical analysis is super useful. Mm -hmm. We can come into a. I hope this is showing itself. <laughs> 
into this triangle. And as that price reaches that point, it's going to do one of two things. It's going to go up or it's going to go down. So I'm kind of, I kind of follow those. That's, those, that's called a wedge. Okay. I like to follow those and see. I could see silver really breaking out up into the 35 zone by the end of the year. Uh -huh. I could see gold hitting 26 or 2700 by the end of the year. Okay. But as both of us know, there's a lot of players in this market with huge stakes and the ability to manipulate it. Mm -hmm. So if a huge player in the metals markets wants the price to go down, they can make that happen. And so that always makes me kind of hedge my bets a bit because it's not really a supply demand thing at that point. Mm -hmm. It's about it's about the whales protecting their interests among different asset classes. Yeah. Um, so I'm always really kind of let's wait and see, think in the think in the short term, make your profits where you can hope it does what you want, you know, in the long term, but just understand that uh, the rug can be pulled out from under you really quickly. And uh -huh. if you're sitting on too much of the wrong stuff at a time where you want to liquidate, you could find yourself upside down for sure. So that's kind of where I'm thinking now is all things being equal, we should see some more upside, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we will. It, it kind of just, it depends on what the big players do. Yeah. And uh, at this point, a lot of short, I don't want to get into stuff I don't understand completely, but people have positions on things. And so once, if silver goes up, then they're pre-programmed, I'm going to sell when it hits this level. Yeah. And the, the reverse is also true. When silver goes down, I'm going to take a larger position in that, at that level. Yeah. So as it continues to break on the upside or the downside, a lot of those players have made their play. And yeah. then it's a matter of seeing, okay, when are the buyers coming in? Right. When are the sellers coming in? And just by kind of following without getting into the weeds too much, and you don't have to understand it. That's something that I figured out. I didn't have to understand it. I had to find somebody I trusted who understood, understands it yeah, and, yeah. and could teach me. So I'm a little bit wary on the to the moon kind of forecasts, although it's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's so, a long answer to a complicated question that ends yeah. up being, I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> um, buy and hold. And, uh, that's the but, easiest dudes dudes let me look right in the camera that's what you should do right there buy and hold then you yeah, don't yeah. have to know everything buy the right stuff have a long-term plan understand yeah. what you're going to do with it and then just sit back and enjoy the ride have fun playing the game exactly exactly so i'd love to do this again in the near future but is there anything that you'd like to touch on right now uh, no, just a message of, uh, let's try to be good to each other as humans, try to show some, some love to somebody who needs some love. Um, we're all flawed humans, but, uh, we all have a, a gift or a light of goodness within us. Just find a way to kind of spread that light, a little bit of love in the world, and try to take care of, of, of each other. That's awesome. Good advice to end on. Pleasure to talk with you. Hi, Ho Silver. And uh, we'll do it again soon. Well, thanks so much. I enjoyed talking to you again. All right. Great. Thank you.